thank you for listening to the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Heard around the world on your Android and Apple mobile devices. The Simple Truth, rising up to explore the difficult topics of real life. Join us as we proclaim the good, the true, and the beautiful with the simple truth of Jesus Christ and His Holy Catholic Church through Scripture, Tradition, and the Catechism. And now, your host, Jim Havens. Great to be back with you on The Simple Truth. We consecrate everything to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Pure Strong Heart of St. Joseph. Today is Testimony Tuesday, where we bring you real, live, first-hand testimonial accounts of the life-giving reality of Jesus and his Catholic Church. Our guest today is Michael Hitchborn, founder and president of the Lepanto Institute. You can find it at lepantoin.org. Michael, great to be with you and to have you with us to share some of your personal testimony today. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Excellent. Yeah, so we always uh, begin uh, with the beginning, uh, childhood. What was uh, what was the family life like? What was the early culture that you grew up in like? Well, let's see. I was born in Texas. Um, my parents were Navy, and, and we uh, moved around a little bit. Uh, about a year after I was born, we moved to San Diego, California, where I lived for about five years. And I have very fleeting memories of what it was like in California. Um, I just remember absolutely loving the uh, the beach, going to the beach all the time, going to the zoo as a kid. Um, but when I was about five years old, my my both my parents got transferred to the D.C. area, so we left California and drove all the way across the country uh, to Virginia. And I've been in Virginia ever since. And <laughs> the very first summer that we were here, I absolutely hated. I was miserable with the uh, the summers here because they were so humid. And, and the summers in, in San Diego were always so uh, temperate. I mean, it was just, it was gorgeous out there. And the, the hot and the humidity and the bugs, oh, it was awful. But, you know, that was the 80s too. And, and uh, I remember... As a kid, I, you know, I was an altar boy here in Virginia. Um, my parent, my grandparents were very active in the 1950s and the 1960s in exposing communists and communist cell networks in Southern California. So when we moved to Virginia, my grandparents realized with both my parents being in the military and uh, just kind of difficult raising the kids at the same time, they thought it was important for them to come out to Virginia. So they moved from Arizona, where they were living at the time, and they came to Virginia and and uh, moved in with us for a time and then moved a, a couple of houses down. And I grew up at their feet. Um, I grew up listening to them tell stories about uh, the things that they had done when they were uh, fighting communism and, and uh, fighting against the encroaching heresies in the church and and I sat and I listened and I, I asked all the same questions and got all the same stories so that I would always remember what it was that they had experienced. And, and uh, it, it's a time that I truly cherish, that I deeply miss, but uh, it, it absolutely is, it, it formed the foundation of who I am today for sure. Wow. So, so you had a strong foundation. What a unique um, upbringing you had there. I mean, you, you had parents um, that were so. Well, I guess the grandparents. The, so your grandparents that you're talking about that were exposing communism um, had a strong Catholic yeah. faith. Um, were those the parents of your father or your mother? My mother. My my father was a Protestant. Okay. Um, so when they got married, uh, I, I remember growing up. You know, we'd go up for communion, and Dad would remain behind in the seat. He'd, he'd be in the pew. And we'd go up for communion, and I kept, you know, why aren't you, why aren't you Catholic, Dad? Come on, <laughs> you know. And and uh, at one point, I was able to serve Mass at his uh, baptism, confirmation, first communion. Wow. So it was, um, it, it was a beautiful thing. But it was my mother's parents who were fighting communism in Southern California, and so uh, 
you know, just, and my grandfather was a real Renaissance man. I mean, he, uh, he worked at a rail yard at the same time that he was married to my grandmother at the same time that they had their first child at the same time that he was finishing up college from, from the war. Cause he, both of them were, uh, military. My grandfather was in the army air corps <clears throat> and he, uh, he actually helped, uh, help do trainings for, you know, flight training. And he was, he was one of the mechanics. But uh, for Doolittle's raid, uh, they used to practice the, the raid there on, on his airstrip. So he got to see Doolittle and all the guys was, as they were practicing for that. My grandmother was uh, a training officer for night flight navigation. So she was running the, the little flight navigator, the, um, the instrument panel that the pilots would then train on and, and learn how to fly. So after the war... They both went to uh, Santa Barbara or Southern California University in, in Santa Barbara, and that's where they met. And uh, after that, my grandmother finished college. She was a little bit older. My grandfather was still finishing college at the same time that he was working at a rail yard, and they had their first baby. So <laughs> that was my mother. Wow, incredible! So, um, so, so your grandparents had a um, a sense of the evil that was taking place within the world on the state level. Um, but, but also yeah. you mentioned that they were fighting against heresies in the church. So they had a strong sense of their Catholic faith as well and, and understanding what was going on with the evils were that were encroaching um, there, a corrupted human element in the church um, in that time. So they, they would have been um, even before, I'm guessing you were born. So you, you were probably, were you born in the late seventies? Is that what it was? I was yeah. I was born in the mid seventies. Mid seventies. Okay. Yeah. So and the thing was, is that, that my. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the um, what my grandparents were doing, uh, they got because they were very active with the uh, the Newman Club in in uh, Santa Barbara. And with the Newman Club, of course, you know, it's a, it's a very Catholic thing. It's a Catholic club where they were trying to figure out ways to, you know, uh, learn about the faith, expose pe other people to the faith, bring people into the faith. Uh, both my grandparents brought several people into the Catholic faith in the course of their work. Uh, but they, they did get involved with uh, a gentleman named Steve Werb. Steve Werb was working undercover with the FBI uh, as a communist in a communist cell network in Southern California. And Steve, who was a very good friend of my grandfather's, uh, he, he, was a, he was posing as a communist. He actually worked his way up the system in that particular network. And as a result of his friendship and my grandfather, who had a top secret security clearance at the time, because he was working with uh, satellites and and uh, at a company called TRW, uh, they came to be connected and my grandfather wound up doing things like going into a communist cell meeting with um, uh, a TITAC microphone and a tape recorder taped under, under his armpit with a button in his pocket. And he was sweating bullets the whole time thinking that everybody could hear that tape recorder engaging every time he pushed the button. But um, he... Uh, Steve Werb, uh, I think I mentioned, testified before the House Committee on Un-American Activities as to what he observed and that kind of thing um, as his time as an undercover agent. But my grandfather would do things like he would, uh, he would record the communist broadcasts coming over the border from, from uh, Mexico. Uh, he would record those and listen to uh, the subversive conversation that was taking place and how they were plotting and planning to try and, and influence modern culture in America. Uh, he went around taking photographs of known communists and, and sharing the information with people. And uh, it was, it was uh, quite an interesting work that he did. Now, I grew up listening to this. And, and as he was uh, exposing communism, he was also learning about the communist influence in the Catholic Church. And my grandmother, who was very astute, uh, was always watching things that were being reported in the news. And she was reading all the newspapers and, and keeping tabs on things that various bishops were doing. 
and she kept tabs on some of the bishops that uh, didn't seem to be saying kind of the right things. And in fact, a lot of their messaging was echoing uh, the communist messaging, especially as it came to social justice. So she kept track of that and started keeping tabs on on which bishops were the ones that we could actually trust in this country and which ones were mm, not so good. And, you know, you can imagine with Cardinal Bernard in and uh, Theodore McCarrick and some of the others that, well, it's, uh, it, it's something that has actually happened in this country. And what's happened to our faith is, is uh, the result of what they were observing. Mm hmm. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, anybody who's familiar with your work, I think this is explaining a lot, some of your background in your early mm -hmm. life, the grandparents that you were blessed to have. Um, what, yeah. um, I guess, let me let me ask you this in terms of being a young person and learning that, um, did you understand, I guess, the value of the formation that you were receiving there in terms of, at that point, was Jesus very real to you? Was the church very real to you? The sacraments real? And also um, this sense of, um, you know, evil in the world and our need to fight that. All of that stuff was was being given to you. Was that all coming alive for you? Was it connecting? Well, that's kind of a long answer. Why don't we wait till after the break? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, let's go to the break and, and we'll be back. And I also want to mention uh, while we have time here coming in, going into the break um, for men to go to the men's march dot com, the men's march dot com, the first ever national men's march to end abortion coming up this Saturday, June the 12th in Washington, D.C. 11 a.m. Eastern is when we will be gathering outside of the Washington Surgery Clinic abortion center. Again, go to the men's march dot com. Michael is going to be one of those speakers there. Also, uh, Monsignor Charles Pope, Father Imperato, Walter Hoy, uh, Dr. Anthony Lavatino, Reverend Dr. Childress, Dr. Alan Keyes, Dr. Michael New. It's going to be a very, very important event. Men, you need to get there, themensmarch.com. We're going to be right back with more with Michael Hitchborn. Podcasts of our network produced shows are free for your listening pleasure at thestationofthecross.com and on our free iCatholic Radio app for Android and Apple mobile devices. Be uplifted in your faith and inspired to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Listen today at thestationofthecross.com or on our iCatholic Radio mobile app. Jesse Romero. I'm a retired Los Angeles cop. I'm a Catholic lay evangelist. You probably hear me Monday through Friday at the Terry and Jesse show. My new show on spiritual warfare is called Jesus 911. Every Saturday at noon. That's a soul patrol Catholic program where three cops on fire with our Catholic faith. You can hear this program around the world on the iCatholic radio app. Jesus 911. Saturdays at noon here on the station of the Cross Radio Catholic Network. God bless you. Keep the faith. Hello, this is Father Frank Pavone of Priests for Life. In Romans we read, If the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also. The spirit of Christ is the spirit of life, and to accept the call to follow Christ is to accept the call to welcome, nourish, defend, and celebrate life. This is Father Frank Pavone, National Director of Priests for Life. Love listening to the Station of the Cross on your car radio, but sometimes find yourself driving outside the listening area? Never miss another minute of your favorite show. Download the iCatholic Radio app so you can listen anywhere in the world 24 hours a day. The iCatholic Radio app is available for your phone in the Apple Store or for your Android phone in Google Play. Visit thestationofthecross.com for more information. The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here. It is Testimony Tuesday, and we are blessed to have Michael Hitchborn with us today, founder and president of the Lepanto Institute. You can find it at lepantoin.org. All right, before the break, Michael, uh, a, big, a big question. Uh, so what was coming alive to you as a young person? You were blessed to have these uh, communist fighting, uh, solid Catholic, faithful Catholic grandparents uh, that were giving you a lot, of, uh, a lot of good stuff. So what was connecting, what was coming alive for you? 
Well, let's start with what wasn't. Uh, okay. I was I was attending to public school, uh, and so I I had a lot of the culture kind of shoved down my throat, and I was uh, swallowing some of the stuff that was being foist upon me. I, I rebelled a bit against a lot of it, but uh, one of the things that always that always stuck with me was the morality. I never had a problem with the morality of the church. Uh, the reality of it, the reality of Christ, the the presence of God, uh, that was that that came later. Um, but I always had a very strong moral upbringing and a very strong sense of uh, moral truths. So I was able to argue with people on that level, and I, I used to get into all kinds of arguments uh, as a teenager. Uh, ask anybody, they'll, they'll tell you I was probably one of the most belligerent people that ever met, and. Um, I don't know. My, I, I would listen to the things my grandparents would say, and, and I loved hearing their stories, uh, but I didn't quite put the pieces together until college. I, I think college is really where I had uh, a, rather a big spiritual awakening. Um, I had a devotion to the rosary uh, in my mid-teen years, and I really do think that it was devotion to the rosary that preserved me from from really actually losing my faith. Uh, I questioned a lot of things as a teen, but it was through perseverance and praying the rosary on a regular and consistent basis that uh, I, I never I never left the faith. I just, and I, I didn't even actually stop practicing it, but I, I got pretty relaxed, let's say. Mm -hmm. And um, well, it was, it was through the influence of my grandparents and it was through the uh, recitation of the rosary that kept me afloat. And then going to Christendom College was, was really the shot in the arm that I needed in order to kind of learn what it means to actually live my faith. Uh, that this world is not our home, that the things that we do in this world are fleeting and, and as they say, as it says in Ecclesiasticus, uh, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And it took me a while. I, I, I heard that line my freshman year in college, and it took me a while to really understand what it meant. Uh, but as I was growing in my knowledge of the faith, it took a while for the wisdom to really kind of seep in. And as I realized that our faith truly is about suffering, that the cross is the center of everything, then I started to really know what it meant to live, to be, and to uh, profess our faith for what it is. And the faith ultimately boils down to everyone suffers, not everyone suffers well. And to suffer well means to love and embrace the one for whom we are suffering. And that's all that it means. Uh, learning that takes a long time, especially if you're as boneheaded as I am. But uh, it's um, it was a learning process that I loved and continue to love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. And so, yeah, tell us a, a bit about um, that decision-making process um, to go to Christendom College and then a little bit more about that awakening that was occurring there. So I said that I was a little rebellious uh, in my teen years, and, and I, I meant it. Um, I hated school. I dropped out of, of high school when I was a junior, swore I would never go to college, and I kind of set myself up to, uh, to go into the workforce and just make my own way with, with uh, you know, a little bit of elbow grease and, and a, a, a can-do attitude. And I... Uh, I actually applied for a job with a real estate agency, and I, I, I interviewed with the people. I was I was uh, 18 years old, <clears throat> and it was it was a big job pool interview. I was one in 20 other people, me and 20 other people, and the interview kept coming down. I went back twice for additional interviews, and it came down to me and 10, me and five, and then me and one other person. And they decided to go with the other person begrudgingly. They really enjoyed my interview. They thought that I had what it took. But they went with the other person because the other person had a college degree and I didn't. Oh, was I incensed. 
I was furious. So uh, that was going on in the back of my mind while I was working, a, a, you know, a, a dead end uh, fast food job. And my best friend called me up. He was already going to George Mason University. And he said, hey, look, my mom wants me to go to Christendom College and I don't really want to go. I said, well, what, what is Christendom? And he said, that's yeah, this small podunky little Catholic college that nobody's ever heard of out in the middle of Virginia. He said, my mom really wants me to go and wants me to go visit. Do you want to come with me? And I said, yeah, sure, absolutely. You know, hang out with you for a weekend and, uh, you know, meet some new people. It'd be kind of fun. So we're on the, he's driving and we're on our way up there. And as we were driving, I, I just kept getting this overwhelming, excited sense. Like I was just really excited about going to visit this college. And I'll tell you, as soon as we pulled into the driveway, I, it, it was literally like falling in love at first sight. I knew the instant we pulled in that this is where I needed to be. And it was, uh, it was definitely a moment of grace. So we spent the weekend there. We did a couple of classes on, on one of the Mondays. I think it was Monday that we were there. And at the end of the weekend, I dropped the application fee and filled out an application and went home and told my parents that I had applied for college. And they, after they picked their jaws up off the floor, um, I told them that the college said, okay, we just need your diploma and your, uh, your SAT scores. And I said, well, what's, a, what's an SAT? <laughs> you know? So they, they said, okay, you need to go get your GED and then you need to take your SAT and all that kind of stuff. And I said, all right, fine. And I did, and I, I scored pretty well on both, and uh, I got accepted, and then they they took me in. And it was the beginning of the most wonderful journey I've ever been on. Uh, I met my wife there. Uh, I met a lot of very good lifelong friends there that I, I still keep in touch with. And um, it, it built a marvelous foundation for what I do now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and certainly you would have gotten a strong intellectual formation there. It's a very strong, faithful Catholic college, whereas there, there aren't too many of those left, and, and that's one of the yeah. one of the top ones for sure. And so you would have gotten that strong foundation w- formation there. But what about um, the sacramental life? Was anything um, happening there? Any any growth that you were noticing in terms of entering into the sacramental life of the church during that time? It took a while. Uh, I um, I was still very secularly minded at the time, and you know I had a couple of girlfriends throughout college, and each time each one of them, I mean, the, on campus they had uh, daily mass, and I would get invited to by friends and by my girlfriends or whomever to go to daily mass with them, and sometimes I would, but and and I look back and I I seriously regret not taking a more uh, committed attitude. <clears throat> I think that I would have benefited a lot more had I, oh, well, I know that I would have benefited a lot more had I actually embraced daily mass. But again, I, I still prayed my daily rosary. Uh, I made frequent visits to, uh, my. I, I wound up developing a very regular confession schedule and I, um, I, learned what it meant to actually go to adoration while I was there and and uh, spent many hours in adoration. We had uh, uh, regular adoration sign up that I was always in attendance to and it was it was um, it was the exposure to the regularity of the sacraments that eventually convinced me or, or taught me what it means to live a sacramental life with the church, in the church, for the church. Um, but it took a while. It was it was not an instantaneous overnight thing. It took a while, but once it took, it really took. Mm-hmm. And you, you talk about that moment where, or that time, it, it may have been a process where you began to understand this aspect of of suffering was at the core mm-hmm. of the faith, that the cross was at the core. Um, was there a point in there that, that would have been um, a big moment or, or a big part of the process where um, it became more real to you that of Jesus's suffering and the way that Jesus suffered for you and the way that um, 
the way that he he poured out his love in in such an unbelievable way as to as to suffer and die for us like he did did that become more real at a certain point towards the end of my college career uh i was introduced to archbishop fulton sheen uh and i started watching his video series and he had a whole a whole talk on the virtue of suffering and it was one of the ones that stuck with me the most and and i i I watched that one many times because i you know um when you grow up with somewhat of a secular attitude um you know like i said i had i had very good parents i had very good grandparents who gave me a very strong moral foundation a very strong philosophical foundation too though my rebelliousness uh made things very difficult and i was uh i i had a i struggled for a while with my siblings i I was not a very good older brother Uh, i'm the oldest of five and uh, i was not a very good sibling to them but i had a lot of woundedness that i carried with me because when i was in public school uh i mean i was bullied rather mercilessly i was a skinny kid uh, I was smarter than any, anybody in the class. I had a very, I, I had a bigger vocabulary than anybody in the class. And anytime I tried to say something or explain something, uh, I got mocked. I got mocked mercilessly. I got, you know, pushed around on the on the playground, whatever. But it was it was a wound that I carried with me for a long time, and I was not the kind of person who was really going to push back. I just kind of walked away from it for a long time. And finally, somebody pushed me to the point where I pushed back. But even still, you carry a lot of anger with you because of that kind of thing. So when I started learning about suffering and the virtue of suffering, um, all the resentments that I had slowly melted away. And I have more to say about this. Uh, but I hear the music, so I'll mm. reserve it for after. Sure, sure. Yeah, we'll be back with Michael Hitchborn in, in just a bit. We're going to uh, get into a, a little bit more of uh, of his story. I, I'm, I'm interested to hear more about um, his, his calling to vocation as a husband and, and as a father, and also get into the, the apostolic work that he's been involved in, that sense of sharing in this mission of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, this mission of the Catholic Church to go forth um, and, and to go out for the conversion of sinners, the salvation of souls. Um, when did that start becoming alive to him? And we're going to get into that some as well. When we get back on The Simple Truth, stay tuned. of the cross we proudly bring the truths of the catholic faith to countless listeners through radio and mobile devices and we're grateful for the feedback we've received i grew up catholic church haven't been in the catholic church for decades but i'm in the process of working my way back for the simple reason that i needed a place to listen to pro-life pro-family messages catholic radio is it it's a place to hear that message without all the political bias and all that that's going on on news talk radio it changed my life it's the only station i turn on the Catholic station is an answer to prayer. It just couldn't be more fulfilling. It's helped me learn more about the faith, and it's helped me to deepen my faith as a result of that. It's on continuously in my house, day and night. You can't imagine how much I receive from that channel. If you've been blessed by listening to the Station of the Cross, let us know. Call 1-877-888-6279, extension 112. Then share your testimonial with us. There was no single event. It was more gradual. You know, eventually you just don't go one Sunday and then you don't go two Sundays in a row. Then went through a divorce and um, ended up being a single parent. If I didn't have church or God, I, I, I would be back at that lonely stage, that trouble stage. Whenever you get anxious and worry about things, you just know that Jesus has it under control. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for any reason, visit catholicscomehome.org. 
Hi, this is Joe McLean, host of the Catholic Drive Time Morning Show, joining you on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network each weekday morning at 7 a.m. We'll keep you informed and inspired with insightful guests and breaking news stories of the day. That's the Catholic Drive Time, weekday morning, 7 a.m. on the Station of the Cross and the iCatholic Radio app. We'll see you then. Praise be to Jesus. Simple Truth. Jim Havens here. Our guest today is Michael Hitchborn. It is Testimony Tuesday, and Michael is gracious enough to share some of his story with us. He is the founder and president of the Lepanto Institute as well. You can find it at lepantoin.org. Um, but go ahead, Michael, dive back into where you were before we uh, took the break there. Sure. So we, we were talking about uh, suffering and uh kind of my journey to understanding what what it means to suffer well um as i was learning in college you know you you, you make a lot of friends and, and a lot of the hurt and the pain and everything else that i endured i kind of swallowed it and put it in my past but it wasn't until i started listening to fulton sheen talking about the nature of suffering and and woundedness and and uh, offering your suffering for others and offering it up for uh, for the salvation of souls and uh, like I said, I had a lot of anger that I had to deal with, and I, I wound up letting go of a lot. And I'll tell you, there's nothing more freeing than letting go of your anger. It's, it's a hard thing to do, but it's, it was one of the most freeing things. There are three instances that I can think of specifically where I learned the nature of abandonment and suffering. And the first was after I... Uh, after I lost a job, when my wife was pregnant with our third child, um, I lost my job and I was searching for a job and I was I couldn't find work. And for several, for a couple of months, things got really harried. We actually put uh, mortgage payments on our credit card. And I remember going to adoration and I sat in adoration and for the first hour, I, I just sat there and I complained. I just complained to God, and I said, I, I, I can't figure out what I'm supposed to do here. You have a plan, and I don't know what it is. And I said, I'm not leaving until I get an answer. <laughs> so I, I sat there in adoration, and I, I realized that for the first hour I'd been complaining. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm through talking. I said, you know my condition. You know my situation. I'm just going to sit and listen. And I sat there and I just stared into the monstrance and I just kept staring. I, I kept looking at our Lord and, and contemplating who he is, who, who is it that's there in the monstrance. And at one point I kind of cocked my head and I, I looked and I said, I'm literally 20 feet away from the creation of the entire universe. What am I worried about? The universe was created by the being who is 15 feet in front of me, 20 feet in front of me. And he is looking at me as I'm looking at him. And I'm complaining as if I'm shaking my fist at the universe that that's going to make anything better. And he knows my needs. He knows my wants. He knows my family situation. And he loves me more completely than I know and love myself. What's more is that this being, this person, was not just the creator of the universe, but also its sustainer. He knows the location of every single atom in every single corner of the entire universe. And here I am complaining. And I said, Lord, I'm not worried anymore. I know you'll take care of it. I will do whatever you ask. And I went on my way. And a couple of weeks later, I got a job working at high school. I helped actually found and open this one particular Catholic high school in Fredericksburg. Then uh, after that, I wound up leaving that job uh, and there was a lot of pain and hurt that went along with it. I was unjustly fired. Um, 
because one of the people that worked there was spreading rumors about me. And um, I had a lot of anger from that. And it took me a while to take the advice of my spiritual director, which was to pray for those people by name. And I remember holding my rosary in my hands and getting to the point in the rosary where we offer up our intentions. And I said, and I offer this rosary up for, and I couldn't say their names. The, my mouth was rebelling against my will and would not say the names of the people who had wronged me. But I forced myself to do it and eventually that pain went away. The hurt went away and my situation improved. I actually got another job working for American Life League, which is where the foundation of most of my work came from. The third time that this pain and suffering, learning the virtue of suffering, and this is the hardest one for me to talk about, um, came in 2011 when my fourth child was being born. Uh, it was a home birth, everything went well, and uh, as things go, you know, the baby was born and, and uh, my wife is holding the baby and everything's fine and, you know, we, we cleaned up, the house was nice, the, the midwives looked everything over, everything was fine. Well, 36 hours later, my wife woke up screaming or woke me up because she was screaming. And I went to go check on her and she was in absolute agony and we couldn't figure out what the source of the pain was. And I did everything that I could to make her comfortable. And I called the midwives. They said that they would be there soon. Well, they got there and they tried to take her blood pressure and they couldn't get much of a blood pressure. They said, we need to get her to, an, to the hospital right away. So rather than wait for an ambulance, I loaded her up in the car and I took her straight to the hospital. And the triage nurse went to take her blood pressure, didn't get a blood pressure. Uh, the, the doctors were scrambling all around and immediately I called a, a priest and I said, I need a priest here. I don't know what's going on, but we, we need a priest. The day went from bad to worse. Uh, it turned out that my wife had a ruptured aneurysm in her kidney. Hmm. And um, then the doctors were talking about procedures, things that they could do. And they said, look, we're going to do just kind of a an orthroscopic thing. We'll run a line up up one of her arteries and we'll try to clamp off the bleed from within. Uh, that way we don't have to do any invasive surgery. I said, okay, that sounds great. They said, it's, it's a real simple procedure. It's not a big deal. Why don't you go home, take a shower, get some supplies, come back and everything will be fine. And I said, fine, okay, I'll do that. So I packed up, I, I went home, I got some supplies, I got to the hospital and I realized that my phone had missed three calls. It was the doctors. So as soon as I got to the hospital, I, I called them and I said, hey, I, I, I saw that I missed some calls. What's going on? And they said, look, something went wrong. Uh, we're not entirely sure, but uh, because we ran the procedure, uh, she had a vascular spasm. It clamped down on this line and we don't know if she has an arterial tear. Uh, we might have to amputate her leg. And uh, at that point, I, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure how I didn't collapse. Uh, I certainly felt like I should, but I, um, I went into the, hot, into the bathroom and I locked the door behind me and I, I wept for a minute and I prayed. And as I did, what I realized, and, and as I was praying, I said, Lord, um, I don't know what's happening. And I, but I do know that this is completely and totally out of my hands. This isn't something that I can control. Uh, this is entirely in your hands and I have to trust. I said, it's, um, it's painful for me to consider that I might have to go home and, uh, and tell the kids mommy's never coming home again. I said, but whatever, whatever you will, is what I will. And it was the hardest, it was the hardest prayer I ever made. So I knew that God knew what we needed. And I knew that 
the only prayer that would be pleasing to him was that I unified my will with his. And that's what I did. And well, uh, a couple of hours later, they performed the surgery and, and she had a full recovery and everything worked out just fine. But it was, um, it was a moment of decision that I realized that embracing the cross and embracing the will of God in that moment was the only thing that would be pleasing. And that's why I did it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how do you think, how do you think that changed you? I mean, something so, um, something so big, a, 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 a moment as big as that, surely it, um, it had ramifications that, uh, that continued on. So yeah. What, what was the change like that took place in you after that? I've never worried about a thing ever again. Um, for the last <laughs> for the last ten years, um, I realized that as long as we live our life with the desire to please God, then nothing else matters. And whatever by embracing God's will and seeking to do His pleasure. Um, whatever suffering comes our way is also his will. And it's that embrace of suffering for the will of God that frees us. It frees us from um, from the terrors of the world. It frees us from the, the terror of attachment to the world. Uh, because honestly, this isn't our home. We're only here for a fleeting moment. And, you know, I've lost my grandparents since uh, since growing up. My grandfather died in 2017. But I know, because he lived a good life, that if I follow in his footsteps and I love God as much as he did, then I have the hope of being reunited with him. So the suffering that we endure, that, that we endure in this life is nothing compared to the delights that come in the next. The reunion is going to be amazing. So really and ultimately, what is there to worry about as long as we are following in line with the will of God? There is no such thing as worry. There's nothing to worry about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, Jesus gives us some pretty clear teaching on that. If we're with him, he, he's telling us, you, you don't have to worry, right? Look at the birds of the air, look at, uh, look at the flowers in the field. I mean, they, they're not worrying. You're, you're so much more valuable than they are. He tells us very clearly, but it is yeah. hard to believe and to actually live, to not worry, but it seems like you've been given a, a great grace in that regard, and uh, that that's phenomenal, right? So we all want to be there. So God, give us that grace, help us not to worry, and that doesn't mean that uh, that we're not concerned about things that take place. Obviously, um, you're still very concerned about different things that take place, and um, and so you fight that good fight. It's not like you're you're passive. Oh, I don't have to be concerned about anything in life. No, you're very concerned. You're living this mission um, of the church. And so let's get into that a little bit. Can you can you share a little bit about when um, maybe it was at American Life League? But when did you start to really understand that there was more of a calling on your life in that regard? Well, at American Life League. Uh, what I was doing was conducting research on organizations like Catholic Campaign for Human Development, and that spilled over into Catholic Relief Services. And the reason was that being a pro-life organization, I was looking for the organizations that were kind of subverting what we were trying to accomplish. And when it became, or when I became aware that the Campaign for Human Development was financing organizations that were promoting pro-abortion laws, and they were promoting a culture of death, Uh, I realized that some of the enemies were from within. So I looked into CRS or CCHD, and then I looked into CRS, and then I looked into Catholic Charities, and I found all kinds of problems. And I've been finding problems ever since. Well, after about three or four years of doing this at American Life League, we realized that the problems that I was unearthing were much bigger than the mission of American Life League itself. It was mostly a pro-life organization. And I was finding much deeper problems. So we had a conversation about what I needed to look into and what we were trying to accomplish. And and, uh, we both decided mutually that it was time for me to move on and start my own thing. And there's a big story behind that too. (laughs) All right, well, we'll go there when we get back. 
And I do want to mention as well that just providentially so, um, it, it has lined up where we will next week on Tuesday for Testimony Tuesday. We've got um, Judy Brown scheduled, who is co-founder of American Life League, and she's going to be with, with us to share some of her testimony. So make sure you tune back in next Tuesday as well. But when we come back right after this break, more with Michael Hitchborn, founder and president of the Lepanto Institute. We're going to get into the story behind that. Again, LepantoIN.org. We'll be right back. Please join Father Mark Noonan in praying the Litany of Humility. O Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me. From the desire of being esteemed, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being loved, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being extolled, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being honored, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being praised, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being preferred to others, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being approved, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being humiliated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being despised, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of suffering rebukes, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being calumniated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being forgotten, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being ridiculed, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being wronged, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being suspected, deliver me, Jesus. That others may be loved more than I, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be esteemed more than I, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That in the opinion of the world, others may increase and I may decrease, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be chosen and I set aside, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be praised and I unnoticed, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be preferred to me in everything, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may become holier than I, provided that I may become as holy as I should, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. Amen. Simple Truth. Our guest today, Michael Hitchborn, sharing some of his testimony on this Testimony Tuesday on The Simple Truth. Michael is founder and president of the Lepanto Institute, lepantoin.org. And I do want to encourage you, if you're just tuning in to this today, uh, go on back and, and hear the, the, the full episode of Michael's story here with us. It really is a powerful one. You can find us uh, via podcast, wherever you find podcasts. You can find us at the Station of the Cross. Dot com. Also, the iCatholic Radio mobile app is a great place to listen. You can also watch us on video if you go to our Facebook page, The Simple Truth. You can go to my YouTube channel, Jim Havens. You can find us on Rumble and Gloria TV as well. But here we are, Michael, down the stretch, final segment. We're to the story of the Lepanto Institute. Go ahead. All right. So... I sat down and had a meeting with uh, my bosses at American Life League, and uh, they explained to me that the scope of my research had really kind of gone outside the, the realm of what they do, and that uh, they really wanted to go in a different direction anyway, and they were giving me an opportunity to move on to another department to do another kind of work, or uh, they would you know, pay me a severance, and I would, would be able to take the time to build up my own organization and do whatever I do on my own. And I said, I'm going to need some time to think about it. And immediately my first thought was, well, so much for that. I guess it's time to go on and move something up, you know, do something else. And I called my wife and I told her what was going on. And she surprised me by saying, well, it sounds like it's time for you to move on. And, and I, I said, wait, I did tell you that I would probably have to leave my job. And she said, yeah, I heard you. And I said, okay. Well, we spent three days talking about it, praying about it, talking about it. And on the third day that morning, <clears throat> I got up and I still was not completely decided and we're talking and 
I, I said, well, you know, here's what I'm thinking. And she said, here's what I'm thinking. And we both said, it sounds like we're thinking that it's time to move on. And I said, yeah, I guess that's kind of where we're going. So on my way into work, I was praying my rosary and I, I was thinking, I've, I, I don't really know what I'm doing. Uh, I still, I'm not settled with this answer. So I stopped my rosary and I just started talking to our Lord and I said, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know what I'm being called to do. All I know is that I want to do what you want me to do. So uh, I, I'm, I'm offering this rosary up specifically for the grace to do what you want me to do. And immediately in my head, I got the thought, call your spiritual director when you get in. I was like, great. It's off my plate. He can tell me what to do and I don't have to make a decision. So I, I finished my rosary, I got into work and you know, had a spring in my step and I called up my spiritual director and I said, all right, here's the situation. And he took a deep breath. He said, look, Michael, uh, I wasn't actually taking any phone calls today, but because it was you, uh, I decided to take this one. And he said, now I know your family situation I know your financial needs and I know what's going on with you and work and everything else and I know what you're looking to do. He said, um, it's time for you to move on. And I said, okay. I said, there's my answer. Uh, I asked for God to tell me what to do. He, he said, talk to your spiritual director and that's the answer I got. So I went in and I sat down with my boss and I, I explained the situation and I said, I think it's time for me to move on. He shook my hand and and uh, we made arrangements for, you know, basically transferring over my projects and everything else to the next person so that there was, uh, uh, you know, a smooth transition from my departure. And that night I got home and my wife and I talked about it some more and she fell asleep and I was still up. So I was talking to Our Lady and I was starting to have that little bit of buyer's regret, you know, that, that what the heck did I just do kind of moment. And I turned to our lady and I said, all right, I got my answer this morning as I was praying. So I'm going to be relying entirely on you for whatever it is that I'm going to be doing. And I said, why don't we start with, what do we call this thing? And in my head, I got Lepanto Institute. And I thought, okay, Battle of Lepanto. My family has a Navy background going all the way back to the uh, American Revolution. Um, I like it. You know, the Institute, it sounds established. It sounds, uh, uh, you know, intellectual. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good name. I like it. And then I got a little smart with Our Lady and I said, okay, what does the logo look like? And in my head, I saw a ship surrounded by a rosary. And as that image was coming into my mind, I got this idea that um, the ship surrounded by a rosary represents the naval battle of Lepanto. And at that time, the church was facing three major crises, the, the crisis of uh, heresy, Protestantism, and Islam. And that the, uh, the church, the recourse to the rosary is what saved the church, which is why the, the ship which represents the bark of Peter, uh, is surrounded by a rosary. And today, the church also faces those same very three crises, Pro Protestantism, heresy, and Islam. And just as it was with the Battle of Lepanto, it's going to be the same thing. Recourse to the rosary is what is going to save the church. And I was really floored by that. I mean, it all just came flooding into my head. And I, my heart was racing, and I was thinking, Oh my goodness. But I didn't want to wake up my wife, so eventually I fell asleep. But I was the first one up the next morning, which never happens because I'm not a morning person. And I was making coffee. My wife came out and she said, well, you're up early. And I said, yeah, well, let me tell you about the conversation that I had with our lady last night. And I told her about the, uh, the, the logo and the name of the institute. And she said, well, that makes sense. I said, what do you mean? She says, well, it makes sense because of what yesterday was. I said, well, what was yesterday? She said it was October 7th. I said, yeah, so? She said, Feast of Our Lady of Victory, Battle of Lepanto, the Rosary. It, it never even occurred to me. It was nowhere on my radar. I had no 
thought of Lepanto at that time. And uh, so that was a very clear sign to me. Well, this is what Our Lady wants me to do. And that's what I did. So that's the genesis. Incredible. Yeah. So we, we only have a couple of minutes left, but um, I'd like to tee you up on, um, on the rosary r- real quick. I think that's a great place to end. Certainly it's been something that's been valuable to you um, as, a, as a way of prayer um, from, from an early age onward. And, um, you know, Our Lady, uh, Mary as our mother is this great, amazing gift to us that God gives us. And then she gives us this gift of of the rosary of this prayer to be able to uh to pray now i guess just any anything you want to share with us on the rosary um in these final minutes would be a great blessing i i think of the rosary the same way i think of the second joyful mystery which is the visitation because what does it say in scripture that after the angel told our lady about uh her cousin elizabeth being in her sixth month Uh, Our Lady, it says, went to the hill country and made haste. And I think about that particular mystery more than the others because I think about Our Lady making haste to us when we pray. She knows our needs before we do. At the wedding feast at Cana, she she, uh, went and um, uh, told our Lord that they ran out of wine. Even the head waiter didn't realize they were out of wine. So Our Lady makes haste. She makes haste to answer our prayers, to answer our needs before we even know we need them. And because of that, if we have devotion to her, true devotion to Our Lady, she will have an abundance of devotion to helping, guiding, and protecting us. Hmm. Yeah, very good. Yeah, we are we are so blessed. Uh, we, we've got this great, uh, this great treasure, that this pearl of great price, Jesus and his Catholic Church worth giving everything for. Our Lady wants to, to help us to do that. Um, thank you so much for being with us today, Michael. Michael Hitchborn, founder and president of the Lepanto Institute. You can find it at lepantoin.org. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you and your audience. Yes, God bless you, Michael. Yeah, what a, what a blessing. Go check it out, lepantoin.org. And we'll see you back here tomorrow at 4 p.m. God bless you. This is Jim Havens, host of The Simple Truth. 